Before I'd like to talk about Murray on the Run, I'd like to talk about the stories. I was just thinking about how many stories that I have accumulated in my life about Jesus. I love Jesus stories beyond anything else in this world. Uh, I love Jesus stories, and the Bible's full of them about Jesus. <laughs> To I've Got a Story to Tell with Dan Skinkus, Season 1, Episode 8. Jesus is always there in my life, which supersedes anything. So I would love to talk about the story that I was in the center of was uh, Murray on the Run. And Murray... I have to go back to the day that we opened up Witness Music Ministries in Henderson, Nevada. It was um, the back end of the casinos there, and we were in the street next to a biker bar. It's funny how God works, because uh, there we were, right next to Baldi's Biker Bar, and uh, we had uh, we refurbished an old barber shop. And just to get a, a view of uh, the old barbershop, there was like 50 dead pigeons up in the ductwork, and the plumbing was from 1920. And we just tore it all apart and got donations from different people in the drug and alcohol um, addiction area uh, of recovery. And um, we made this thing into basically a spectacular little storefront for Jesus. And in it, uh, we didn't advertise it, but people were attracted to it. And uh, many young girls came there and said, hey, what's up? What's doing? What is this all about? And then um, uh, adults came, the men came, the women came. They wanted to know. It, it was like they were drawn to this place. And we had meetings. We had AA meetings. We had Bible studies. The pastor used to come over from the Four Square Church, and and uh, and we'd have Bible studies there. And it, such a, uh, a conglomerate of people from different walks and came. Anyway, I'd like to talk about Murray. Murray was a, a very loud person, an exciting person, and funny. You could be around him. His volume and his humor and all of that did not uh, offend you. It just made you laugh, and it, it just tickled you. He was like a up person. But Murray was on uh, drugs when I met him, and uh, he had a bad uh, heroin pr uh, problem and um, his father was the uh, head guy for Henderson Parks and Recreation uh, Landscaping and uh, Murray his mother and father were uh, from the Mormon faith and Murray was running rampant and uh, the first time I met him we, we had just this great rapport and he would call me dad for some unknown reason I'm like 38 years old he's calling me dad so that's how he would represent he would that's how what he would talk to me hey dad how you doing how's it going today what's going on so Murray tried to get clean and sober for I would say a good Two years we knew Murray, and he'd come in and out of the club, he'd come to meetings, then he would go out on a runner, and then he would uh, go into North Town, and nobody went into North Town, Vegas, especially at night. You, well, I drove a cab for a little while, you weren't allowed to take that cab into North Town, that's how treacherous it was over there. But Murray used to go in there to buy his drugs over in North Town, and he was pretty much addicted, and then he had a girlfriend who would run with him, and they were... Definitely running and gunning. I mean, they were like, uh, they were really critical in their drug addiction. So you look at these two people from the outside looking in, the snapshot now are two people, druggers. You know, who wants to deal with druggers? Who wants to be around druggers, you know? Uh, but God gave us the grace and the mercy to open his place up. And uh, we embraced those people. We knew their problem. We came from the problem. So we knew the problem. Uh, I get a phone call one night, and um, Murray's uh, saying, Dad, Dad, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. 
I, 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 I'm going to die. I said, what, what's going on? He says, I'm out at the Mojave Indian Reservation right on the border. He says, and the Hell's Angels are cooking meth in a, a cave out here. He says, and I broke into the cave, and they got those AK-30, whatever those rifles are. He said, and uh, they went out to lunch or something, so I just, <laughs> I just grabbed their meth. And I'm on the run, and they saw me leave, and, and so uh, I don't know what to do. I said, Murray, <laughs> what to do? Just keep running. So his father picks him up somewhere, I don't know where, and saves his life, takes him home, and that episode's over. But it went on for hours. We were like so concerned that Murray was fooling with dynamite. So you would think in an addict's life that would be enough. I mean, that would be like the last straw. I hit my bottom. I'm almost a dead man. Uh, that was that had nothing to do with it. So. Murray kept coming to meetings and, and crying and trying to get out of his addiction, and I understand that. And so, <laughs> uh, the day comes where he wants to accept Jesus. And you know, the Bible says very simply how to accept Jesus. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say, and then you got to go to church, and then you got to do this, and then you got to do that. No, it's as simple as that. So dealing with Murray, uh, I was burned out with his behavior. This went on like two years, and he said, hey, Dad, no, I want to accept Jesus today. No, I really do. And I'm going, yeah, okay, Murray. So we go in the kitchen. I said, Murray, say this. Dear Lord Jesus, dear, so he says, dear Lord Jesus, come into my life. And he accepts Christ. But it's no, the lights, the buzzers, nothing happened. We were just looking at each other. And I'm looking at, I'm thinking, and this is the, the old flesh judgment. Uh, Murray, I don't think so, man. I, you know, I, you didn't cry. You weren't sincere. You didn't tell me anything. So, okay, good. You accepted Jesus. I accept that. And uh, another year goes on. Murray's just... His father, he worked for his father. They finally fired him. The city fired him. And now he is on the streets. And cooking the the drugs and cans and living like uh, just begging and borrowing and and uh, it was pathetic to see Murray at that level he just hit bottom and so one day he comes to the club I'm really angry I, I had enough of Murray you know I loved him but I'm I'm angry so he says hey dad how you doing I said not too good Murray I says, you know what I'm tired of? It's the fact that you've been in every program. Your, your parents spent 20 grand on recovery. You've been in an AA. You've been in an NA. Uh, and nothing. Nothing at all. I says, and look at you now, man. I says, I'm concerned. I said, you, your only hope, your only hope, get on your face. before God and cry out and have him save your fat butt. Do it or you're done. You won't exist anymore. Well, he looked at me because we never had that conversation. He looked at me like, whoa. So, uh, Neighborhood Church was a place where a lot of the musicians came out at the time of the revival of the hippies, and it was a, it was a really good church, and the pastor was like, because of the population there, he kept everything in order and everything on time, and no variance from a lot of different things that were, and, and there was a lot of spiritual move in there, but he kept it all the way it was supposed to go. So we're about... 20 minutes, 30 minutes into the service, and the back door opens, and we hear this crying, and, and crying, and him and his girlfriend come into this church and do a, 
they were told to do. Get on your face in front of the Lord and cry out for repentance. Sure enough, man, the service stops. They're in the middle of this awesome worship. It flatlines. There's not a peep. Half of that congregation got up and started praying for Murray and his girlfriend. Just stopped the service. Basically, I think that service was over after they didn't even continue with it. And the power of God, you could feel it. Your hair was standing up. And uh, thinking, Lord, I hope that this is it, that Murray. And so I uh, so I have to do the baby steps in the. So Murray start coming to church. His girlfriend start coming to church. They get an apartment. They're living together, but they're not married. They get married. Just a progression of maybe six months. Uh, Murray gets a job, stays on the job. They're not using, they're not abusing. Um, Murray got an interest in playing the guitar. And the way this church was designed, they, these guys were so good, the worship group, that you had to wait five years. I had to wait 10 for some unknown reason, but five years before they let you up in that worship, on that platform. But Murray... Uh, he learned that guitar and the speed of sound, man. He just was a natural at it. And sure enough, man, there was Murray playing worship music, loving God, ministering on the streets, witnessing for Jesus, powerhouse, you know? And uh, Murray always used to say, I don't know if I'll be able to get this out. Hey, Dad, remember in Revelation? When Jesus gets on that white charger, he said, man, when I get to heaven, I want to be in that corral and just take care of that horse for him. So Murray was about when it all started, his recovery, 26, and at 32, he just passed away. With a family, he left his children, just passed away. And nobody knew to this day what, what happened. He just passed away. And I always think of Murray being so loud in that corral, saying to Jesus, are you ready yet? Can I put the saddle on it? And I always see the Lord going, not yet, Murray. You're listening to I've Got a Story to Tell with Dan Skinkus. We'll be right back after these brief messages. Two thousand twenty, the year of barriers and closed doors. But no longer here at First Presbyterian, we are committed to opening doors and the gospel to Carson City and beyond. We are open. Join us as we celebrate God's love and share it with a world 
longing for open doors. Stories, interviews, music, news, mission, stories, interviews, music, news, mission, stories, interviews, music, news, mission. Aunt Betty's studio is producing stories, interviews, music, news, and mission messages. It is a new and exciting avenue for opening the gospel to Carson City and beyond. For all creative types, there are opportunities to get their projects out to the world. For all technical types, there are prospects for learning new skills and gear. For students, it solves the logistical issue of how to get community service hours. There is something for everyone. Aunt Betty Studio is a ministry of First Presbyterian Church, Carson City. Stories, interviews, music, news, mission. You get it all from Aunt Betty Studio. Welcome back to I've Got a Story to Tell with Dan Skinkus. Well, I like to talk about the most important thing that happened to me in my life. You know, we go through life and we're put into a family we didn't ask to get there. We are putting it into an environment that we didn't have any choice to be in. And we're raised and we go to schools that we didn't pick this is the best school for me as a little child so you end up in kindergarten first grade second grade and there you are you're sort of like predestined in this whole thing and you can't understand how you got there so in my life I was uh, not the best student couldn't learn that easy um, and uh, so I didn't get my self-esteem from uh, being an A student um, or, or too much of uh, how I looked at myself in perspective. So at 26 years old, after being drafted into the Army and coming out of the Army, um, I didn't know what direction I was going to go and I worked for a place called Allen, Oregon. I was there five years previous and uh, and now here I am. And um, so to make a long story short, I bought a house in Levittown, Pennsylvania for $16,000. And um, that was, I uh, was married to my first wife, Jane, and we had our children and um, I started what was called back east paper hanging was a big deal. It was people didn't paint their houses for Easter. They paper, they got the paper hanger to do it. So this uh, man who was the same Czechoslovakian, that's the only reason he taught me the trade, but he took me under his wing and taught me this trade of paper hanging. And uh, I was making good money for a young guy and... Uh, Although, with that came my habit of drinking. So I brought it in, my family drank, uh, everybody drank around me, and they functioned. They were quite functional. Had hop nice houses, nice cars, never were in jail. And so this was my, uh, 20, at 26 years old, I was um, drinking and had this business, big old Continental in my driveway and basically miserable. Uh, I just didn't think this was life. And, and uh, this little uh, sort of a gray-haired lady came into my life and as a housekeeper. So um, she would have a, she had a Bible under her arm and studied this Bible every day. And I'm like, I don't even know what a Bible is. I came from a religion. There were no Bibles. There were prayer books, and that was it. And you didn't have no Bible, and she would read the Bible and then say something, Dan, could you look at this? 
And I go, so she showed me a passage in Romans, and I look at it and go, yeah, all right, okay. You know, and then I'd go to work and come back. And so after like uh, a month of this, she's bugging me, like, I was saying, here's the thing, Jane. I understand your faith. I understand all that. But you know what? If you keep doing this, you can't work for me anymore. I'm, I'm done. You know, I'm not, this is really bugging me. She says, uh, I'll tell you what. If you go to a revival with me, um, I will never tell you anything about this Bible again, and I'll work for you. Fair enough. I said, this is... And it's funny how you can recollect on the biggest night of your life what, what it was. It was a rainy night, humid in Pennsylvania. Went to this little Baptist church, and I had a raincoat on, like a black raincoat. And uh, must have had a couple beers and just walk into this. And I'm used to a big church with a lot of gold filigree and all of those things that these big Catholic churches had. And there's this little church. That never been in a building like this that they call church. And here, so I walk in and I sit down, but I sense something that I never sensed in any other place that I was as far as church it was something that was sort of like moving next to me, like, <laughs> like, to be your buddy <laughs> like and I'm like this <laughs> Jane can we leave she said why I said I don't know man uh, this is spooking me and she says no she says wait just wait a while so uh, it's revival night and they play some awesome music. I mean, the Baptists love their music, I guess. And man, they had, they ripped it. They just had some awesome choir. And, and this old man comes up to the pulpit. It's not the pastor. It's uh, this old man with a cast on his leg. And he hobbles up to the pulpit. And I'm thinking, who is this guy, man? I'm used to like a decked out priest guy. Who is this guy? And uh, has this Bible, and cracks it open, and man, I know something's going on now. As soon as he opened that Bible, I'm like, oh man. I said, Jane, we got to go. She says, just, and she's so accommodating, just wait a minute. It's all right, it'll be fine. And uh, previous to that, I told her, I want. I want to know all about this Bible and all of this faith stuff and all of that. I said, when we leave, I want to talk to that pastor. Well, that was the last thing I want to do, talk to that pastor. <laughs> so she says, uh, so, the, so this old man gets up and uh, he opens this Bible. And he... He would take that Bible, and there would be a tear in his eye. And I remember all he could, all I remember him saying for a good half hour, three quarters of an hour, you need Jesus. With all the sincerity and knowledge and wisdom in those words, I melded like. <sighs> so, uh, it's finally over, man. I'm like. Okay, Jane, let's go. And I'm getting really, like, weak. So he, um, she says, okay, let's go. So this pastor was a good-looking guy, man. He's like blonde hair guy, and he could play the piano, and he was just an awesome guy. So we're walking up the aisle. You see this good-looking guy, and he says to me, uh, and I don't really know who he is, uh, hey, how you doing? And real calm. Oh, good. He says, I heard you want, want to talk about the Bible with me. Like, <laughs> I said, uh, well, maybe not tonight. He said, well, tonight's as good as any other night. He said, come in my office. And he was so accommodating, you know. So uh, I'm sitting there at the chair. I'm squirming. I'm thinking, I got to go home. Uh, 
I really got to go home. And he's give me Romans road for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Well, what do you think about that day? And I'm like, yeah, okay, you know. And uh, so the war, the war, I remember a war. I cannot explain it to you other than Paul said there's a war within my members. And there was like two things pulling me. For a half hour, I resisted this. So finally, I wasn't tired out. I was just ready, I think, because he presented the case of my uh, life is pretty sad as I looked at it and got honest and I said, yeah, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'll never forget it. I'm shaking like this. I, I, I'm shaking and finally says, would you like to? And I said, yes, yeah. so I say these words, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. I did him. And as soon as he got done with that last word, it was like a, a gate shut like that. And I like I stepped into something like I stepped over a threshold into this place. And it was like. Jesus, I remember that transition so well from death to life. I remember that death to life. And uh, I was so happy. I went home and I told my wife, I said, oh, man, you, you know, you know, I, you got to come with me next week. She says, Dan, it's just another thing. <laughs> It's just another thing. And um, no, come with me next week. She says, all right, I'll go with you. So she came from a pretty hard life. She lived in the, in the projects and uh, very sad life when you look at her life, looking back. Uh, so that week, these uh, ladies asked me, or there was visitation. I saw it up on the thing, and I want to get into this. Now I'm for Jesus. So I'm going for it. I said visitation. And I said, uh, I want to go. Because I came from a Czechoslovakian background where visitation happened. You sat down. They, they put the food on the table. We, we had a great time. So I'm thinking that's what happens. The church people, they go from one house to the other, and then they set up the plates, and you're good to go. So, uh, never forget. I arrived that night, 7 o'clock. And as I'm coming to the uh, office to meet whoever I'm visiting with, or going with, Pastor says, hey, Agnes, funny I can remember, hey, Agnes, how many people did you bring to Jesus last week? <laughs> she said, well, we're a little short, 15? <laughs> you know, I'm like, what does that mean? Bring them to Jesus, 15 people? So I remember these little ladies. They all seemed short, like five foot. They all had the bun tied at, you know, 900 pounds uh, torque. All clean, no makeup, dressed to the tens. And now we're going witnessing in the projects. That's because the church was centered into this uh, low-income neighborhood. So, uh, and they were so sober and... You didn't fool around with them. You know, they were like, you knew, you respected those ladies. Just your instinct knew it. So, Agnes would knock on the door. These big dudes would come out, man, and I'm scared to death, thinking I'd have died tonight, man. So, big tattoos. I think beer in his hand. I'll be. Agnes would say. We're here from the Baptist Church, and we would love to have you come to our service and um, meet the people of our church. But beyond that, we're here to tell you about Jesus, and that's what we'd like to do tonight. So the guy would look at her and like, come on in. 
kids running around, craziness, filthy apartment. And the ladies would hold the kids, quiet it all down. Pretty soon, this big dude's on the floor crying like a baby accepting Jesus. And I don't know nothing. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, what is this? I remember I did it, but... So we go on and on, and I think that one night there was eight, eight or ten people that came to Jesus. Now the phenomenon was, I was in a, uh, a bus ministry. I joined the bus ministry. Man, I'm on fire. I joined the bus ministry. We would go Saturdays around all of these neighborhoods, and uh, kids would be out playing football in the days and baseball, and we'd say to them, hey, you want to come to church? Oh, yeah, we want to come to church. I said, uh, Sunday school, yeah, oh, man, we want to. So we'd fill the buses up because the parents go out Saturday night and party, and they were, like, hung over and say, take my kid to church because the kids would bring home their Sunday school work and these parents were drawn, I'm telling you, they were drawn to this church. And pretty soon this church starts filling up like with these people. And you talk about some broken people that get put back together by Jesus. They're strong Christians. They start going ministering. And, and uh, so to end the story was that my ex-wife, um, we finally make it to church. I think she dodges it another week, and I find she finally says, yeah, I'll go with you. We walk into that church. I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not making this five feet into that church. And this was one tough woman, and she's bawling like a baby. Bawling. She can't even walk. She sits down. I said, what's wrong? She says, I don't know. And then she says, I do know. She says, you know, when I was a little girl, about 10 years old, we went to Bible school, summer, summer Bible school, and I accepted Jesus, and I didn't remember until now. I didn't remember that till now. You're listening to I've got a story to tell with Dan Skinkus. We'll be right back after these brief messages. Do you look forward each week to the midweek announcement blooper reel? Did I already say that? Can you see the fun we have creating content for worship in Aunt Betty's studio? Because let's face it, these announcements are nothing if not entertaining. Are you able to laugh at yourself? Our, uh, blah, 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 blah. If you answered yes to at least two out of three of these questions, congratulations. You have what it takes to be a midweek announcer. Uh, wow. Oh, for two. No prior experience needed. You will be given a script. And are, have we stopped rolling? No. Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Multiple takes due to mistakes are encouraged. Take three. <laughs> this is the most fun you can have as we open the gospel to Carson City and beyond. <laughs> I see people creeping. <laughs> see Sandy Hatchell. Sherry Gurney, or Bob Davis to sign up. Hurry, space is limited. Reserve your spot while you still can. May no do that. <laughs> or think about it and get back to us. We have room for and would love to have each and every one of you join us at least once. <laughs> This quiet moment is just a reminder to take time 
to remember who you are and whose you are. God loves you so very much. Welcome back to I've Got a Story to Tell with Dan Skinkus. So that's my story about how I got to where I am today, and it's a wonderful place to be. And, you know, I don't know who I'm talking to, uh, but I'll tell you what. The simplicity of accepting Jesus Christ is just saying that you need him in the heart, your heart and that you are a sinner. And that's why he was raised from the dead to take care of your sins. So I hope you embrace that and get it because it's the most wonderful walk I've taken in my whole life. I've Got a Story to Tell is a podcast of PresbyPod, a production of Aunt Betty Studio, a ministry of First Presbyterian Church, Carson City.